Good evening to everyone. Welcome to Bible study. We are so grateful for our conference call line and for those who are joining via Facebook and YouTube. If you are joining after Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'm glad that you're here. It's okay to catch it late if that's what you need to do. It's just a blessing to be able to study God's Word together again. For those of you where it may be your first time, I'm Dr. Talika McCoy, and we gather on Thursdays uh, to study God's Word. And so um, if you're looking at me, you see this background that says Dr. Talika McCoy Ministries. Sometimes I'll have a green background. When I have a green background, then that's when I'm doing the talk. And then there are times when I have a black and white background and you just have to come and see what that's about. But if you can see me, then thank you for being here and uh, I really appreciate you and just wanted you to know about those backgrounds. And if you're on the conference call line, I'm so glad that you are here. We've had our conference call line much longer uh, than we've gone live on social media. So thank you to the dedication of those on the conference call line. And so we're going to get back to Matthew on today. We are journeying through the book of Matthew. Many of you know that we went through the minor prophets together. We went through the major prophets together. So now we're in the New Testament, okay? And we'll get back to the Old Testament eventually. But I wanted us to look really at the story of Jesus's life. And we find that really in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so we've already gone through the book of Mark. And so now we are traveling through Matthew. So if you missed the last time we were in Matthew, that's okay. You only missed ch chapters one and two. Okay, so on this evening, we're going to focus on chapters two and three. I mean, three and four. So if you weren't here, that's okay. Uh, chapter one, many of us may already know, that was really about the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And then chapter two, we looked at how the wise men, they were seeking Jesus. And then Mary and Joseph fleeing to uh, fleeing with Jesus to Egypt. And so now we're in chapter three, and this is where John the Baptist begins his ministry, okay? And so you're here at a great time. Let us open with prayer. God, thank us. Thank you so very much for having us together once more. God, I pray that you will bless our Bible study in the name of Jesus. Amen. So on this evening, we're going to focus on baptism and temptation. That's what we find in Matthew chapters 3 and 4. So I hope I've talked enough to give you time to turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 3. So I'll talk a little more just so you can get it, okay? And whatever version you have is fine. And if you happen to not have your Bible there, that's okay. That's why this is recorded and you can come back and fact check me so that you'll know that, uh, you know, with this Bible study, I try my best to stay focused on the word and what it truly says and not just so much what I think, but what the word says. We get to see a lot of opinion on the television, right? <laughs> on social media. Um, so this is not about my opinion. This is not about me. It's, it's about us. Uh, learning. So many years has passed, okay? So understand that uh, between Matthew chapter 2 and 3. Um, at the end of chapter 2, I think we remember, and I just recall, Jesus was a boy. Um, by Matthew 3, Jesus is a young man and he's about to begin his ministry, all right? Um, but before he begins his ministry, understand that two important events needed to happen first. The first event uh, was baptism, and the second event was temptation. So the initial 12 verses that we're about to look at in Matthew chapter 3 describe the ministry first of John the Baptist, who was sent to prepare the way, all right? So when I mention chapter 3 starts with his ministry, I'm talking about John the Baptist. And so John is going to baptize Jesus Christ, um, and then immediately following that baptism is another type of baptism, if you will. Um, it occurs, it's a baptism of fire, where Jesus faces terrible temptation. So if you have faced temp temptation in your life, or if you're facing it right now, we're going to see what we can do about that, you know, as Jesus, as our example, okay? So by successfully overcoming temptation, which we're going to see, um, you know, the Messiah, Jesus, proves ready to undertake his father's work. So that's what we're about to see. So let's get into this. So I have before me both the King James Version and the New International. No, that's not the New International. I have the Contemporary English Version, okay? So I may switch up, go back and forth. But when we look at Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 12, 
The Bible tells us that years later, John the Baptist started preaching in the desert of Judea. And he said, turn back to God. The kingdom of heaven will soon be here. Do you see that? Verse 3, John was, uh, was the one the prophet Isaiah was talking about when he said, in the desert, someone is shouting, get the road ready for the Lord, make a straight path for him. So we have read the entire book of Isaiah together. So we're familiar with connecting Old and New Testament. So we're already familiar with that. So we know about that, right? So understand that John the Baptist being a forerunner, um, he's a relative of Jesus born uh, to the priest Zechariah and wife Elizabeth. Remember that? I'm pretty sure we remember that. Um, and the Bible says in verse four that John wore clothes made of camel's hair. See that? Um, he had a leather strap around his waist and he ate grasshoppers. Your Bible may say locust. I'm reading from the contemporary English version. Your Bible may say locust. Oh yeah, the, the King James version right here does say that. So your say uh, John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins. So that's the, the, the belt around his waist, like I mentioned. Um, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. So depending on what version you have. We understand the clothes of camel's hair and a leather uh, belt, they show that John was poor. But not only did those two items show that he was poor, it connected him to really lifestyles of former prophets, um, such as Elijah, all right? Um, and locusts, I know most of you, some of you may know this, but locusts are still eaten today. <laughs> there are people who eat grasshoppers even today, and they're really listed among the clean foods in the book of Numbers. You know, has anybody ever eaten bugs? Some people do eat bugs. I guess a locust may not be a bug, but to some of us it may be. But just understand that both his clothes and his food suggest that John knew a great deal about wilderness living. So as we read this, we may say, he's preaching in the wilderness? Well, you know, wherever you are, you should be sharing the word of God. <laughs> so if he's in the wilderness, that's a good place to preach. <laughs> and then some of us think of the wilderness as being a negative place even now in 2023. Some of the things that we may be going through makes us feel like we're in a dark place, a lonely place, a bad place. And sometimes we describe that as a wilderness experience. Well, then, if you're in the wilderness, then that's a good time to talk about the Lord. You know, that's what John the Baptist is doing. And so he's preaching this message, turn back to God, the kingdom of heaven will soon be here. Now, I'm going to talk about the kingdom of heaven in a little bit when we get to Jesus really preaching the same message. So I'll hold out on that. Um, but look at what uh, John the Baptist told the listeners. And he is particularly talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And I've talked to us before about the Pharisees being a legalistic party of Jews who separated themselves really from those who did not join their uh, practices. They were really strict um, and oftentimes they were hypocritical in their administration and they kept the law of Moses and the tradition of the elders, but they would do those things and sometimes make up things as they went along, you know. And so if you run into that in 2023, then that's just a fair say of nature, you know, of human beings, right? Um, and then uh, John is also talking to the Sadducees and I've talked to us before about the Sadducees. The Sadducees was a smaller group. They were not out in the streets, if you will, so much so like the um, like the Pharisees. Um, but they were more they were more worldly and they were politically minded. And they also, as I mentioned before, they denied the resurrection. You know, I had a professor when I was in seminary that would say they are sad. You see, <laughs> so you know, if you say Sadducees. One of the ways to remember that political group, sad, you see, it was sad, you see, that they did not believe in the, res the bodily resurrection. It was sad, you see, that they did not believe in angels. And it was sad, you see, that they did not believe in spirits. So that's one of the ways I remember that particular group. But anyway, these are mainly the people that John the Baptist is talking to in uh, Matthew chapter 3. And what is he saying to them? Let's look at the word. Let's see. He's saying, turn back to God. So I'm still in uh, Matthew chapter three. If you're just joining, we're looking at the preaching of John the Baptist right now as we focus on baptism and temptation. OK, we're going to going to get to Jesus. So from Jerusalem and all Judea and from the Jordan River Valley, I'm in verse five, crowds of people went to John. So here is this preacher, John, and people are coming to hear him. <laughs> That's good news. 
um, they told uh, they told how sorry they were for their sins. So you see, these people they respond to John's preaching. This is important for preachers to hear. They respond to John's preaching in a particular type of way. Okay. The Bible says that they told how sorry they were for their sins. Isn't that something? And John baptized them in the river. Now, in 2023, sometimes we don't even talk about sin. You know, and when we do, we talk about it in sweet little ways. <laughs> you know, um, I won't get too far into that because one of my sermons for this uh, month, I'm going to focus on that. So I won't talk about that too much. But, um, but John is preaching to where these people are turning from their, their sin. They told how sorry they were for their sins and he baptized them in the river. Where well, here comes the Pharisees and the Sadducees that I mentioned, okay? So verse seven, many Pharisees and Sadducees also came to be baptized, but John said to them, you bunch of snakes. So John is not biting his tongue. You bunch of snakes. Okay, let me see what the King James Version says. Okay, so I've looked at my... Contemporary English version. Let me see. Matthew chapter 3. That's verse, what, 7. Okay. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers. Oh, yeah. That's another way to say snake, right? Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. So he's calling them to repentance, okay? Okay. So let me read a little more from the contemporary English version. Verse 9. And don't start telling yourselves that you belong to Abraham's family. I tell you that God can turn these stones into, ch into children for Abraham. An axe is ready to cut the trees down at their roots. Any tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into a fire. My goodness, John. I tell you, how do you think people would respond to his preaching in 2023? Well, hmm. I tell you, it seems that, uh, you know, in 2023, you don't tell me what to do. In 2023, you can't judge me. You're just a man up there preaching, or a woman. <laughs> You're just a man, right? Mm. In 2023, you can't talk to me like that, John the Baptist. You can't preach like that. You ought to be preaching things that just make me feel good, by the way, and tell me that God is going to bless me with a car, John the Baptist. You know, well, a horse. <laughs> Tell me that God is going to, or cattle. That's what, yeah, that was their currency then. You tell me that God is going to give me more cattle. You know, don't tell me that. Oh, John the Baptist is saying in verse 11, I baptize you with water so that you will give up your sins. But someone more powerful is going to come. Oh, now he's about, he's talking about Jesus. And I am not good enough to even carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire and with fire. You see that? So we're going to move on to the uh, baptism of Jesus in verse uh, 13. But I wanted to sit there for a minute. Oh, good. Someone's responding to here. Sister Michelle, she's saying 2023, you have to sugarcoat the word. Oh, look at that. That's why I love you all's comment because the Bible, it really pushes us to think about how we're doing things today. And, you know, somebody can say, well, you can't tell me how to do what I do. You know, you can't tell me. Well, the Bible can. It should. Shouldn't the Bible dictate the way in which we do things? Hmm. I hear you, Sister Michelle. Well, I don't hear you, but I'm reading you. <laughs> but I've met you before, so I have actually heard your voice. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you for sharing. Hmm. Okay. So then, let's move on. Let's move on, you bunch of snakes. Okay, so let's look at, um, I'm not calling you snakes. I was just repeating the word. Oh my goodness, I didn't say that at the right time. So, okay, let's stay right here for a little bit. Um, I didn't call you all snakes. I said you bunch of snakes. I was reading the Bible, okay? Um, so then, Sister Michelle, with you saying that, uh, you know, we have to sugarcoat the word. Okay, let's think about, uh, Sister Michelle, ways that we won't sugarcoat the word when we preach it, if you're preaching it, uh, when we teach it, if you're teaching it, and then when you're reading it. So let's stop right here, Sister Michelle, and let's think about how we don't sugarcoat the word. Okay, maybe what we should do is raise questions to ourselves. There are questions we can ask ourselves when considering God's word because we need to apply it. 
um, when we study that might help us to, yeah, in application, like I'm saying. So the first question, is there sin for me to avoid? So Sister Michelle, first we have to say, what is the sin? So if I'm reading my Bible and sin is introduced in that passage, then that's when I get to question myself and say, what sin do I need to avoid? And then there's the sin right there. Okay, that's one way for me to, um, you know, to remember uh, or to really consider how to apply the word. Okay, um, is there sin there? Okay, is there a promise for me to trust in? That's another one. So sin, that's an S. P is promise. Is there a, is, is there a promise in here that I need to trust? Okay, um, let's do an E. Is there an example for me to follow? I think just now reading about John the Baptist would be an example for me to follow. So S is for sin, P is for promise to stand on, and E is for example. Okay, what about uh, command? Is there a command for me to obey? Isn't that good? Because again, we don't want to just be hearers of the words or readers of the words, but we want to be doers of the word. So is there a command for me to obey? Okay, this is about accountability. And then the last thing, uh, how can this passage increase my knowledge of God? And I've said this before, when we are reading scripture, what we need to find is the eternal truth. What will not change, no matter how culture changes, you know, because remember now, we believe that our God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. So what is the knowledge of God in this passage that I need to take with me? So that's S. It's almost like the word speak, Sister Michelle. Because what we're doing is, and I'm only calling your name because I love how you said don't sugarcoat the word. You will not sugarcoat the word when you, S, is there a sin in there that I need to avoid? P, is there a promise in there that I need to stand on? E, is there an example in there that I need to follow? C, is there a command in there that I need to obey? And then K, is there knowledge about God in there that's never changing? So that's like saying speak, but just not spelled the right way. S-P-E-C-K. There we go, Sister, Sister uh, Michelle. We'll do that, okay? So, okay, let me move on. But, I mean, you kind of sparked something there, you know, because I try to, when I read the word, I try to think about those things. Sin, promise, example, command, and knowledge. Okay, so let's move on to verse 13. Okay, I'm, that's why I'm glad this is recorded. I see you, Sister Michelle, saying read the verse before and after, before and after the verse uh, that you are trying to use to prove your point. We always use a verse to prove Oh, it won't let me read the rest of it. Yeah, I, I tell you, Sister, Sister Michelle, I know there are some people say we always use a verse to prove our, our point. I don't know if that's what you're saying, but I know that sometimes human beings do that. But she's saying read the verse before and after the verse. That's right. So read it in context. And that's why with our Bible study, I try to take you word for word. <laughs> you know, um, not because I think I know it all, but because I'm challenging myself, you know, even as a minister. Don't skip over anything. Read all of it. Study all of it and, and learn. Okay, Sister Michelle, yes. Okay, so that's what you meant. Okay, so that's what we're, we're going to continue to try our best to do. So let's look at verse 13. I'm still in Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse 13. And I try to get through these things, but you all know that if, if the Holy Spirit says, no, let's stop right here and let's talk about this, and that's what we're going to do. <laughs> you know, I don't ever want to be the kind of person that's so wanting to get into a lesson and get it done that there's no room for the Holy Spirit because you may say something uh, that's needed in this space at this time for tonight. So I prepare it all, but I don't necessarily tell it all based on what my agenda, okay? So let's look. So Jesus, um, in verse 13, the Bible says, left Galilee. And the Bible says he went to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John kept objecting. And John said, I ought to be baptized by you. You know, why have you come to me? I would have been the same way. I mean, you're, you're Jesus. And Jesus answered, for now is, you know, this is how it should be because we must do all that God wants us to do. Then John agreed. So Jesus was baptized. And as soon as he came out of the water, the sky opened and he saw the spirit of God coming down on him like a dove. Then a voice from heaven said, this is my own dear son, and I am pleased with him. Okay, let's try to apply what I said with this, that S-P-E-C-K to just these uh, few verses here. 
Let's see, it's like one, two, three, four, five verses. Okay, so Sister Michelle says, read before and after. So let me pick one of the verses, Sister Michelle, and then I'm going to read before and after. Let's see. Well, let me say this. Uh, let me read the last verse. Then a voice from heaven said, this is my own dear son, and I am pleased with him. Okay. So, Sister Michelle, I could say myself without, if I didn't read the first part up there, I could say something like, um, the Lord is saying, you know, um, I am his daughter and he is well pleased. Well, that's not necessarily wrong, but that's what God said about Jesus and I'm not Jesus. So, I have to be really careful with carefree, you know, being carefree to apply everything to me. It's like when people say, I'm blessed and highly favored of the Lord. Well, that's Mary. Mary said that. And she is the mother of Jesus. You're not the mother of Jesus. So it's okay to say some things, but it's not okay to at least know, like Sister Michelle is helping us, like know about it in context. So if I walk around saying, you're my dear son and I'm well pleased with you. Well, that's what God said to Jesus. And sometimes we have to be so careful um, to not take that which is sacred and, and kind of play around with it, right? So then instead of doing that to say, well, God said to me, I'm his daughter and he is well pleased. Okay, wait a minute. Let me see. Okay, S was for sin. So I don't see how, you know, it's sin in here for me to avoid. Well, maybe it is because, you know, I don't need to mock God or something like that. But okay, sin. Uh, a promise for me to uh, stand on or to, to trust? Mm -hmm. Let's see, before that, let's see what we said before. Okay, maybe not. Jesus left Galilee. Okay, maybe not that. Um, an example for me to follow. Ah, let me think about that. An example for me to follow. I see you, Reverend Ward, saying context is important. That's right. An example for me to follow. So I think I might be safe with this one. So let me just try. Example for me to follow. So my main scripture was then a voice from heaven said, this is my own dear son and I am, I am pleased with him. Okay, maybe an example for me to follow. How would God be well pleased with me? See, now I'm not saying to anybody or to myself, God is well pleased with me. Wait a minute. God is the one who gets to say, I'm pleased with you. So then I can say, if heaven opened and God were to say something about me, what do I think that would be? Hmm. Because I see what God said about Jesus. Now, I'm not Jesus, but I'm just saying in my everyday life, if the, if, if the sky opened up and God freely said something about me, what might that be? That might be the, the example. So I said S-P-E example. C was command. So I'm looking at, at verses 13 to 17. Let's see. Um, I mean, Jesus told uh John the Baptist, I guess, to baptize him and said, we must do all that God wants us to do. So maybe I could say, well, I must do all God wants me to do. I mean, what kind of commands have I read in the Bible that I need to apply to my life? You know, I could possibly do that. I'm just, I'm just trying here. I'm not saying that we have to be perfect at it. I'm saying work through it so that we won't just read scripture, but we will apply scripture. So then let's go to the K. How can this passage increase my knowledge of God? Hmm. Perhaps God gives assessments, <laughs> right? We go to the doctor and we get checkups, right? That's like an assessment, right? Um, children in school or adults, you, you're assessed. You give, you, they give you a test to see how much you know and or how much you can know. Pre-test, post-test, those kinds of things. Hmm. Does God give assessments? So what I'm saying is those are only a few verses, but we can apply the S-P-E-C-K to these verses. And like Sister Michelle said, we will be reading before and after, uh, trying not to prove our point, but to really see what the word is, uh, is compelling us to do. What's the action behind what you just read in scripture? I hope that as we have these Bible studies that that's what you're doing. You're saying, you know what? Okay, Dr. McCoy, because I titled everything. So if you can't remember anything but the title, Dr. McCoy talked about baptism and temptation. How can I apply that the next day? See that? Yeah. So anyway, okay, I'm going to move on to chapter four now. But I hope I gave us an example of how not to sugarcoat, you know, but to read it for what it is and apply it, you know, to our lives. 
So then let's look at uh, chapter four, because in chapter four of Matthew, if you're just joining us, we're in chapter four. We're about to talk about the temptation of Jesus. And, you know, many of us are familiar with that, but we never take for granted because there may be somebody joining our Bible study who's not reading the Bible like that. And so they're going to read it with us. So let's take time for those of us who may know the story, you know, to not assume. Let's look at the story. No matter how much you know a story, you know, just call it a good rerun, like those good Golden Girl. Uh, I love to watch reruns of Golden Girls. You know, it's like Golden Girls, okay? So Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Now, let me just say that um, that Matthew chapter 4, verse 2 talks about Jesus fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. But please understand that he may have still had some water, something to drink. Why am I saying that? If you look at that verse two, it said, well, verse one says the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert so that the devil could test him. Isn't that something? I could talk about that all night. The Holy Spirit? Hmm. <laughs> Sister Samantha, this is good. Oh, well, praise God. Thank you. Thank you all. I see you all saying things on point. Amen. God bless you all. Okay. So I'm glad that this is, this is going to be applicable. Okay. So the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the desert. The Holy Spirit did that. Okay. So he could be tempted. Mm. That's an entire sermon right there. When the Holy Spirit leads. Hmm. Into the desert. So, okay. After Jesus had gone without eating. You see, that's why it takes me a long time to read my Bible. Because I just stop. And I'm just like, hmm. I have to think about that for a while. So that's why I'm not a person who has read through the entire Bible. I really commend those people. Because I haven't done that yet. And I take my time. So I guess before I die, I'll do it. <laughs> but um, but I just enjoy being where I am. So the devil, um, it says, after Jesus had gone without eating for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. It didn't say he didn't have water. And we know Jesus to be divine. And we know Jesus to be human. And, you know, humans don't usually go that long without water. Maybe without food. But anyway, it could be argued. <laughs> But the Bible says that he had gone without eating for 40 days and 40 nights. He was very hungry. Then the devil came to him and said, if you are God's son, tell these stones to turn into bread. So I won't read all of them. I'm going to highlight all of the temptations. So I wrote it down. Um, I said all of the temptations. I always like that group called the temptations. <laughs> but, um, but there are temptations. There's three of them, okay? So I just wrote them down so that we can keep moving. So uh, I wrote down the first temptation, tell stones to turn into bread. That was the first temptation that the devil offered. But then Jesus responded, no one can live only on food because uh, people need every word that God has spoken. Okay, so then the devil comes again and says, jump off the highest part of the temple. And that's right there in your Bible, okay? Um, then Jesus responds, don't try to test the Lord your God. So then uh, the last temptation, the devil says, I will give all kingdoms and power to you if you bow uh, to worship me. So then Jesus says, go away, Satan. That's verse 10. Go away, Satan. Uh, the scriptures say, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So we see that Jesus responds to the enemy using the word. That's why I commend you, not just for being on this Bible study, okay? I'm so glad that you're here with me. Um, and so many of you attend Bible studies. You know, this is not the only one. Like, you know that there are people out there really teaching the Word of God, and you are hungry for that. And I want to encourage you to keep doing that, because the enemy would try to use Scripture against you. You see what I'm saying? And so you have to know how to use the Bible as an assessment tool. Oh, I said this in one of the Bible studies I did recently at the church. Let me say this. Yeah, I'm going to say this. So, mm, Jesus is using the Bible now in conversation with the enemy. Okay? The enemy is attempting to use scripture as well. So then this means as a believer, you have to be sure that you use your Bible as the greatest tool even when it comes to conversation with negative energy. Your own mind sometimes will try to tell you negative things. And what you have to do is combat those things with the fact that you know that to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
So if you're going to be spiritually minded, that means that you have to have the word of God hidden in your heart. And then when it's time for that thing not to be hidden anymore and your own mind tries to attack you, you bring out those words and they pour from your heart. Now, that's not actually the part that I told the church. Let me get to what I was going to say. This is what I really, that was something else. Thank you, God. But this is what I'm trying, this is what I was saying. Your Bible in 2023, and I was going to put this in a sermon, I, I, I may still do it. Um, but in 2023, your Bible is your assessment tool. You know, in 2023, there are people who will say that you can't judge me. You know, you can't tell me this and you can't tell me that. You need to be able, as you walk through a dark world, to say, it may not be my job to judge, but it is my job to assess. And I have an assessment tool. And if things don't line up with that assessment tool, then they are what they are. And when I talked about calling out the sin and things like that, that's in the Bible. You can assess a person, a situation, and even yourself with your assessment tool. And if that thing is a sin, then it simply is. So then when people say, well, you don't love people when you, you know, do certain things or say certain things. No, I love you and I know the word. So then I am assessing your life, my life, everything around me with my assessment tool. This is what Jesus is doing. He has already, he has the assessment tool within him. And so he's able, as the enemy brings certain things and say, no, 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 that's not right. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, there are actually things in our world that's not right. And there are those who are no longer calling out those things. But you have the duty to call them out, not because of what you think, but because of what you read. Now, there are people who will, you know, uh, who will interpret the Bible in very different ways. And then there are lists in here of sin, okay? There are some things that there is no interpretation. It says what it says. And I'm not going to go there because we'll be on here all night long. But you need to find, well, I might actually go there. But you need to find in your Bible certain things that helps you to assess the world in which you live. And if these things don't add up, then you simply need to say, no, I'm, I'm right, not because of me, but because of the word of God. So there are so many things in this Bible. Okay. Okay. If you turn your Bible, this is an assessment tool, okay? I see you, uh, I see you Sister Ingrid, saying the Bible in 2023 is my assessment tool. That's right. Because when you read... Uh, what is it? Psalm 1. It says, blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the something, you know, walk in the way of sinners. And you know, <laughs> and sit in the seat of the scornful. You know that one? Okay. How are you going to know who the wicked are? How are you going to know who, you know, the scornful are? How are you going to know that if you simply say, well, no, I'm not going to say that that's how they are. Okay. You don't say anything. Open your Bible to Romans chapter, let's see what this is. I'm looking at one. <laughs> I'm just giving you an example of an assessment. Romans chapter one, and I've just left Matthew, but, but Romans chapter one, I, I just want to give you an, ex an example. If you look at verse 28, I have the King James version here. This simply says in Romans chapter one, verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness. Here comes a list. We may not like it, but here it comes. Fornication. Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, uh, whispers, backbiters, haters of God. It goes on and on. Uh, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding. There is a list. And this is not the only one. But what I'm saying is, if you connect that uh, Psalm 1 scripture to saying don't sit in this seat and don't be around these person and all this stuff and it's telling you not, not to listen to ungodly counsel, you need to know what ungodly looks like. I need to know what ungodly looks like. And there is a list in the Bible that at least gives us a start so you can love people but don't love these sins. Okay, let me move on. I see you, Sister Ingrid. We are not exempt from self-assessments. That's right. Oftentimes, I have to check my own heart and behavior. There you go. So that's why I was saying earlier when thinking about the S-P-E, 
C-K, the S was sin, Sister Ingrid. And so when we read the Bible, we have to ask ourselves, is there a sin here, you know, for me to avoid? Is there a sin here that I'm guilty of? Calling myself out and then assessing those around me so I don't sit within the, uh, you know, that I don't accept unwisely counsel like Psalm 1 says. So what Jesus is showing us here is that when you have the word, you can't deny that you have it and you have to apply it, use it, even as an assessment tool for yourself, for self-assessment and for the assessment of who you're sitting with. Okay, I'll move on, but <laughs> I have a lot to say tonight, don't I? So then when we look at Jesus there, Jesus is now in verse four uh, about to begin his work. So the Bible simply tells us, you know, as he tells the enemy to go away, that Jesus begins to preach. Okay. He begins to preach in verses like 12 to 17. Do you see that? And Jesus's message is clear. And this is why as a preacher, I try my best to assess. Here comes self-assessment. Like, what are you saying when you get up to preach? You know what Jesus said. What are you saying? <laughs> and I'm pointing at you all, but I'm pointing at me. What are you saying? So Jesus is the best preacher ever. So let's just see what Jesus is saying, okay? Let's look here. So Jesus is there, and verse 17 says, Then Jesus started preaching. Turn back to God. The kingdom of heaven will soon be here. That's his sermon. <laughs> now let me read uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 in the King James Version so that I can see what you all read. Oh, I have to turn back. I'm in Romans. Thank you all for being patient with me this evening because I... I just feel that I'm I'm supposed to keep going. I'm not going to. Let's see. It's 736. Okay. So let's look here. Let's see what you all have, King James Version people. So verse 17 says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's it. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's his sermon. So then, hmm. I say to myself, hmm, what am I preaching? Now, my sermons are a little longer than that. <laughs> but that's what Jesus is saying. So let me talk. I said I would mention what the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what that means. I said that, right? So let me make sure I do that. Oh, I see you, Reverend Ward. You're saying SP. Oh, man, I don't know why Facebook won't let me see all you all are saying, but I see a question mark by the P. Okay. Okay, Reverend Ward. So I said the S was for sin. I said the P was for, uh, are there promises in this text that I need to uh, stand on? That's what the P was. I see your question mark there. So, so S is, is there sin for me to avoid? Uh, P is, is there a promise for me to trust? E, is there an example for me to follow? C, is there a command for me to obey? K, I think I missed one. No, I, no, E, okay, S is for sin, P is for promise, E is for example for me to follow, C is for is there a command um, for me to obey, and then e, K is about knowledge, knowledge of God. You know, how can this passage increase my knowledge of God? So I hope I answered that for you. And um, yeah, oh, you said thanks. Okay, I got it then. Okay, so back to, um, let me just give you this and then I'm going to, to let you go. Um, because then after this, Jesus uh, calls his disciples. But I need to say this because if Jesus is preaching in verse 17 of chapter 4, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and we are preachers or we are God's persons who are supposed to go and tell people about Jesus, we need to understand what Jesus preached. Because in 2023... Preachers like me, I'm preaching Jesus, right? Because I'm like telling people, come to Jesus, come to Jesus. Well, Jesus isn't preaching Jesus. Jesus is preaching. Um, you know, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. So what he's saying is, abandon your wicked ways, people. That's what he said. Abandon your wicked ways. Uh, turn around in an organized fashion, almost like military people do. You know, they're going one way and then they do something called and about face. Now, I don't know a lot about the military, but I think that's what it is. 
um, military people can help me with this, but it's like you're marching one way and then you like turn around in an organized fashion. That's what Jesus is saying. And face the direction from which you came. You came from a good God. You know, and then Adam and Eve did what they did and human beings, you fail. But now you're going to face in the right direction and you're going to go from which you came. So when thinking about Jesus saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he meant that you need to repent. That's what he's saying. Um, and quit revolting, if you will. I'm talking in military terms. But you need to keep, you need to uh, stop revolting and you need to start following God and not that wicked way. That's what he's saying. You need to do that ASAP. And with your life and with your actions, you need to follow and obey God's command rather than the command of evil, like being in the military, right? So about face, that's what he's saying, about face, turn around from your wicked ways and come on because the kingdom of heaven is at hand and you need to come on back to the God who created you. And that is what Jesus preached. Turn back to God. The kingdom of heaven will soon be here. And then verses 18 to 25, which is the last part of our lesson for tonight. Um, he simply calls his first disciples and he tells them what? Come with me and I'll teach you how to bring in people instead of fish. And so Simon and Andrew, which Andrew was first, you all, uh, we talk about Peter a lot, but his brother Andrew was really first. So Andrew and Simon, Peter, um, are the first. And so they drop their nets and they leave. It's right there in scripture. I'm just summing up verses 18 to 25. And the, then Jesus uh, carries on and he sees two, two guys and another man there, older man. And it was James and John. And their father's name was Zebedee. So the Bible says that Jesus said, come with me. And they left the boat and their dad. <laughs> and they followed Jesus. So that's where we are, okay? So then we'll continue to look at, at, uh, at Matthew. Um, and just understand that, you know, in chapter 4, um, even verse 23, we see Jesus teaching, preaching, and healing. And the word just uh, spreads. So the last thing I wanted to say to us is the same way that the word of Jesus Christ spread in Matthew chapter 4 verses 24 and 25. You know, the news about him travel. I want us to be encouraged to, to spread that same news. And you know, if you're in North Carolina, spread it like people spread the news of that sheets gas that was $1.77 the other day. <laughs> so spread Jesus like they spread sheets gas. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word, God. We thank you for teaching us, God, um, not just how to read it and how to hear it, but how to apply it. Thank you for your patience with us as we continue to learn and grow. I pray for all of my friends that you will continue to keep them excited about your word. Every church they're connected to, every Bible study, every worship experience, God, please continue to enhance them. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. God bless you all. I know it was a little longer tonight, but it is what it is. Um, but thank you so much for Amen being here. <laughs> That's right, my Amen. sister. It is what it is. So I thank you all so very much. And I just pray that you will continue to be safe. And I'll keep you in my prayers. God bless you. Have a good night.